Mathematicians call this pattern the torus. The energy in a torus flows in through one end, circulates around the center, and exits out the other side. It's balanced, self-regulating, and always whole. I was first officially introduced to the torus by scientist and inventor Arthur Young. Futurist Dwayne Elgin explains how the torus is the primary pattern that nature uses for life at every scale. Evolution means to, uh, to unfold, to roll out. So the question is, what is the universe rolling out? And what the universe is rolling out is self-organizing systems. And you can see this at every scale. A self-organizing system is a technical term for just uh, a system getting a hold of itself, uh, knowing itself, essentially. And uh, if we go to nature, uh, we, can, we can look at and we can see the self-organizing forms uh, throughout. We can see it. In, in the cross-section of an orange, the cross-section uh, of an apple. We can see it uh, in the dynamic nature of a tornado. Uh, we can see it in the um, magnetic field around the Earth, a similar magnetic field around a, uh, an individual. We can see it in the structure of an entire whirlpool galaxy. Uh, we can see it in the structure uh, of, a, of a small atom. Uh, at every scale throughout its entire history, the universe has one single project. It's growing toruses. The universe is a torus growing factory. These toroidal dynamics are visible at various scales. One of them is at the galactic level, which are huge spinning structures with billions of stars in it. Looks like typically big arms of galaxies spinning around and they have vortices that goes from the center out to the edge of the galactic halo that surrounds them. Stars move from this galactic disk out to the halo, down the vortices, and back out again. Stars like Arcturus, for instance, we know have done that path already. That's the appropriate description even for the atmosphere of our planet. The weather goes from the North Pole down to the equator and then back up, from the South Pole up to the equator and then back down. Even the dynamics on the surface of the Sun are very similar. Of course, here we're looking at it from an external perspective on a small-scale model. When you look at the solar system embedded in the galaxy, embedded in the cluster, embedded in the supercluster. We're traveling in this boundless sea of infinite Taurus flow. The Taurus is like the breath of the universe. It's the form that the flow of energy takes at every scale of existence. But there's also an underlying structure in how the flow fits together, sort of like a skeleton. It's called the vector equilibrium, a term coined by one of the 20th century's greatest thinkers, Buckminster Fuller. Inspired by Fuller's visionary work, I spent decades researching the dynamics of the vector equilibrium and the torus. I became so excited by the potential of the toroidal energy form that in 1997, I co-founded a multidisciplinary think tank called the Sequoia Symposium to study the pattern and explore its applications. Our collected research convinced me that the torus and the vector equilibrium are primary patterns, fundamental to the creation of the universe at all scales. At the Sequoia Symposium gatherings, I learned of inventors who claimed they were using the torus dynamic as the basis for devices that generated energy without combustion. This revolutionary development 
Accessing what's sometimes called zero point or radiant or free energy is now being called most simply new energy technology. Given that so much of the suffering in our world is the result of lack of access to energy, I realized that free, unlimited, clean energy would be one of the greatest breakthroughs in history. It could not just improve, but actually transform the quality of life on this planet. So I began to wonder who else knew about this pattern or about this powerful potential energy source. Some of the scientists at this symposium showed me how the Taurus has been encoded by different cultures for millennia. Apparently, ancient cultures had embedded this code in the most enduring forms then possible, in stories, in icons, in alphabets, and buildings. Here we are at one of the world's oldest sacred sites, the Osirian Temple at Abydos, Egypt. Very little writing is found in the Osirian Temple. However, there is one very significant piece of information in that temple. It is a very faint but clear and precise drawing. It's not etched into the rock, it's not carved, it's burnt into the atomic structure of the rock in some extraordinary way. Nassim has decoded the Osirian symbol in three dimensions. Since our world is not two-dimensional, it makes sense that codes relaying information about our world also wouldn't be limited to flat designs. His three-dimensional version of the Osirian symbol starts with the vector equilibrium, a perfectly balanced force field with 12 equal energy lines radiating out. They stabilize its center like the 12 spokes of a wheel. The primary pattern of balanced energy flow around this structure is the torus. Here we expand to the next larger scale with a total of 64 pyramids called tetrahedra. If we then put spheres in representing the toroidal energy field surrounding each of the pyramids, and then we drop away the pyramids, we end up with a matrix that is, amazingly, an exact overlay for the Osirian icon, a three-dimensional model of the same pattern that was burned into the rock wall of the Egyptian temple thousands of years ago. Now we travel across continents, from Egypt to China, where the same geometry appears at another sacred site built in 1420. Then you go to the Forbidden City, where the sun gods reside, and where you find at the entrance the foo dogs, the guardians of the knowledge. They guard the knowledge under their paw. The same geometry of 64 energy units is encoded again. I started wondering, is it just a coincidence that the exact same design appears in significant places on two different continents? But then Nassim showed me that this geometry of 64 is encoded time and again in cultures across the centuries and from all over the world. The Hebrew Kabbalistic Tree of Life creates the same structure we just saw, with the vector equilibrium again embedded at every level. The ancient Chinese system of wisdom called the I Ching is based on 64 hexagrams, symbols with six lines in a set, some continuous, some broken. These can be put together as the six edges of a tetrahedron and together would form the 64 tetrahedron crystal. This same pattern shows up in modern scientific research. The double helix has an alphabet of 64 codons that are used to encode our human DNA. I had seen that there was advanced knowledge of the living geometry of the universe thousands of years ago, but how on earth did they know about it? 
most of the stories of ancient Egypt and Mayan and Incas talk about sun gods coming to the earth and teaching them uh, engineering and writing and all of their science. I started to wonder if all these sun gods were not advanced civilization coming from another part of our galaxy. These texts and many ancient culture describe them as coming in flying boats or in the Vedic tradition, flying machines and so on. There is many mention of these sun gods coming through time. Could these early pilots from beyond our world be the ones responsible for sharing the knowledge of this code? Could they actually be tapping its power to propel themselves through the cosmos? This isn't where I thought my research would lead me, and these notions were rocking my world. But Nassim has impressive evidence to back up his theories, and I could see no other rational way advanced math and physics concepts would have been recorded over 3,000 years ago. I sought out one of the most knowledgeable investigators, Dr. Stephen Greer, the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He's conducted hundreds of interviews with top-ranking government and military witnesses. And so when we talk about extraterrestrial intelligence, we're talking about uh, civilizations that have reached the point of, of being sentient like we are, but whose technologies and perhaps social capabilities are such that they've been able to become interstellar or interplanetary civilizations. And when you look at the fact that the most conservative estimates are in the Milky Way galaxy that there are at least 10,000 Earth-like planets that have intelligent life on them, and that at least half of them are likely to be as advanced or more than ours. It's almost a certainty that there's intelligent life out there that have mastered uh, the laws of the universe beyond what's currently taught at MIT and Caltech to be able to transfer through space-time in real time through vast distances of interstellar space. We have over 4,000 cases where these objects have landed on terra firma and left physical evidence. We have over 3,500 pilot cases. We have hundreds of cases, including ones from the highest ranking investigator at the FAA, John Callahan, and numerous other operators where these objects have been tracked on radar going tens of thousands of miles per hour or dematerializing and then reappearing in another point in the sky. Yes, there have been ET visitation, there have been crashed craft, there have been uh, uh, material and bodies recovered. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country but from some other solar system and I have been a party to that. There were documents that I have seen that refer to the Roosevelt uh, having several instances of uh, UFO flyovers, and particularly after they took on board uh, nuclear weapons. And my SEAL told me, Jordan, this, you know, what have you got in your log? This never happened. There was crew going on duty, and there was crew coming off duty, all saw the UFO just hovering in midair. It was a metallic circular object and uh, from what I understand, the missiles were all shut down. That means that went dead. And something turned those missiles off. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead, tumbles out of the outer space. The feeling at the time was that it must have been extraterrestrial. They took the film and they spooled off the part that had the UFO on it and they took a pair of scissors and cut it off. They put that on a separate reel, they put it in their briefcase, they handed Major Mansman back the rest of the film and said, here, I don't need to remind you, Major Mansman, of, this, of the uh, severity of a security breach. We'll consider this uh, incident closed. But who do you tell that 
you were involved in a uh, UFO incident without them looking at you like you, you ain't wrapped too tight. Out of all of the evidence for the existence of UFOs, one extraordinary phenomenon continues to astonish and inspire me. The appearance throughout the world of so-called crop circles. These elaborate designs appear mysteriously swirled into crops of grain in such a way that the stalks are bent over, yet remain alive. More than 5,000 of these patterns have appeared in over 30 countries, most of them in England. The media has led many people, including me at first, to write these crop patterns off as hoaxes, the nighttime work of a few pranksters. Of course, there have been faked versions, but those made by human hands are crude compared to the vast majority of these elegant creations. Could hoaxers have created all 5,000 of these patterns? Could a few people with ropes and boards have created something as complex and beautiful as this one, made in the dead of night in a driving rain and leaving no footprints in the soil? The electromagnetic field over the area where the crop's been laid down to create the image is often electrostatically charged. Some of these areas are littered with strange magnetic particles. One of the most amazing crop designs is not a circle, but a rectangle that seems to be a direct response to a message sent out into space in 1974. The message was a radio signal depicting our planet's location in our solar system and Earth's people in hopes that it might be received and interpreted by an extraterrestrial intelligence. 27 years later, in 2001, this crop design appeared in England, along with what could be a self-portrait of the sender. This message matches the format of the NASA signal and describes a different solar system from ours, a picture of the sender, non-human DNA, and a microwave antenna they apparently used to communicate, rather than the radio antenna that we used. The antenna symbol had appeared a year earlier in exactly the same field, right next to a working radio wave antenna, like the one NASA used to send out the original signal. NASA continues to officially deny extraterrestrial contact of any kind. And yet, year after year, these spectacular creations appear. So what might these remarkable designs mean? Here are some two-dimensional versions that seem to be revealing the Taurus in 3D. Here is the vector equilibrium. And the related pattern of 64 that we saw encoded in the arts of so many ancient cultures.
When I saw the coherence between the crop circles and the ancient encodings, I thought regardless of whoever created them and wherever they're from, there must be an important purpose to these designs. They're so coherent. I've come to believe that the pattern of the torus and the vector equilibrium, especially in the form of the 64 tetrahedron crystal, is showing us how energy works in the universe so that we can learn to align with it. I believe that they're giving us a model for accessing energy in a clean, safe, and limitless way, and a new means of propulsion. What more important message could there be to get to us, and especially now, from their perspective, as we're beginning to extend our careless reach beyond our planet? I got further confirmation of this notion when I met Dr. Jack Kasher, a former professor of physics at the University of Nebraska, who has also researched UFO phenomena. Presenting at a Sequoia Symposium, Dr. Kasher showed a remarkable series of drawings by a woman named Lane Andrews, who claimed to have been invited onto an extraterrestrial spacecraft. I was startled to see her detailed sketches of the toroidal energy field that she said propelled the vehicle and protected the passengers. I subsequently interviewed James Gilliland. James has many hours of UFO footage from his ranch near Mount Adams in Washington State. He also claimed to have gone on board an alien spacecraft. What blew my mind was that he had never met Lane Andrews and had no knowledge of her experience, yet he described a phenomenon that was amazingly similar. Numerous ships with spinning rings of light. Could it simply be coincidental that James and Lane described the same Taurus dynamic and that both of these people have been harassed extensively by government and military agencies? To some, the idea of UFOs may sound crazy. And yet, from another perspective, it is completely plausible. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old. That's 4,500 million years old. What if there's another planet that's almost exactly like us, almost exactly, 4,501 million years old? They're a million years ahead of us. And on a galactic scale, they're almost our twin brothers. So where are we going to be in a million years? We'll have solved all these problems, and there's another way, uh, whether it's wormholes or warping space. There's got to be a way to generate energy so that you can pull it out of the vacuum. And the fact that they're here shows us that they've found the way. This is a major uh, shock. Uh, to the human system that is uh, in process. I understand why people in our generation, people who aspire to positions of political leadership, etc., never dare go near that question because it's a worldview challenge. It's a fundamental worldview challenge. So here we are, a relatively immature species struggling with possible self-destruction. If aligning with the Taurus does hold the key to a new form of clean, safe energy access, imagine the implications. This could be the most important technology breakthrough of our times. So who wouldn't want to have an energy source that's unlimited and freely available? That turned out to be a key question. And that's what led me down the next rabbit hole. It turns out that scientists as far back as the early 1900s have been developing alternative ways to access electricity without combustion. Nikola Tesla believed he had tapped into what he called radiant energy. Many scientists believe he was accessing what's now called free energy. But before Tesla could finish the project, his financier, banker J.P. Morgan, who had a monopoly on the copper used for electrical lines, recognized how Tesla's invention could transmit electricity without wires. He then shut down Tesla's funding. Tesla's lab was burned down and he was ostracized, all for trying to implement his vision of unlimited energy for everyone.
A modern day inventor, Adam Trombley, was inspired by Tesla's work and by the possibilities of the Taurus. Trombley built a dynamo, a direct current generator that accessed electrical power right out of the air. We were trying to demonstrate that by mimicking the magnetic field of a planet and rotating this device, we could actually create a dynamo that would work. And in fact, it did work, and it does work. So when we contemplate nature, when we contemplate Jupiter, or we contemplate a dynamo like the Earth rotating in space, we're basically talking about a magnet which is rotating in space. And the lines of flux of the magnet are pouring down and through in this toroidal pattern of the magnetic field. It's also expanding and contracting. It's breathing. It's taking in the energy of space, literally, and transforming it. Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. And that's not just a theoretical statement. It's literally true. To contemplate the implications of this means that every single place on Earth suddenly has power. Every single person on Earth suddenly has power. We have universal abundance. Trombley had been invited to demonstrate one of his generators at the United Nations and the U.S. Senate. But these events were undermined by the first Bush administration. Then the device itself was taken in a government raid. Trombley's experience isn't unique. Almost every time I found an inventor with a promising new technology in the field of free energy, he told a similar story of suppression. Inventor John Bedini began working with Tesla's theories of radiant energy decades ago and has produced an assortment of battery charging devices that generate more energy than it takes to run them. He announced that he was going to start offering them at low cost. Soon after that, he was attacked in his lab and warned not to produce the devices. For his own safety, he had to let go of marketing free energy. These are all devices from labs I personally visited. Now. Now the quality of this footage is obviously poor and I'm not expecting this to convince you. My point is that being there with these inventors, accompanied by experts, and seeing these new energy devices in operation convince me that the technology is real. And the implications of that to me are absolutely thrilling. Canadian John Hutchison not only created some free energy batteries, but also used Tesla's theories to counter gravity, to make objects float. This could revolutionize the field of propulsion. His lab was raided and equipment was taken by police and government officials in 1978, 1989, and again in 2000. One of the scientists we were going to interview for this film was Dr. Eugene Malov, an engineer from MIT and Harvard, and editor of Infinite Energy magazine, which covers both theoretical and technological developments in the new energy field. Dr. Malla was mysteriously beaten to death in 2004. If these inventors were all hoaxers and charlatans, I wondered why are they being suppressed so consistently and so brutally? I asked free energy inventor Adam Trombley why he thought this technology was being suppressed and if the UFO phenomenon was related. We've had major military people at great risk to themselves say, yes, these things are real. Why do you think the military industrial complex doesn't want that statement to be made? Because you start thinking about what kind of technology is behind that. That's the bottom line. The suppression of UFO phenomena is hand in hand with the suppression of so-called free energy. The energy is extracted from the fabric of the space around us which means it cannot be metered. That is a direct threat to the single largest industry in the world, energy. It's goodbye ExxonMobil, goodbye oil, goodbye coal, goodbye linear transmission of electricity through power lines, all that gone. Unfortunately, it's someone's $200 trillion piggy bank. The 
proven oil and gas and coal reserves are worth north of $200 trillion. This information coming out would completely change geopolitical power more than anything since well in recorded human history. And it would happen in a generation. I started to examine the breakthrough solutions. And much to my surprise, these concepts have been proven in hundreds of laboratories throughout the world. And yet, they have not really seen the light of day. Rather than smashing things together and trying to control the explosion, these new technologies rely on blending, of dancing with what naturally is. The common denominator of all the free energy devices I've seen is that they mimic, in one way or another, the torus energy shape. You don't have to believe in free energy technology to be concerned about the repression of ideas and inventions. I found myself thinking, what better way to justify our dependence on oil, coal, nuclear, and other dangerous and dirty technologies than to claim there are no better, cheaper alternatives? It was my beloved wife and creative partner, Kimberly, who kept bringing me back to the human implications of my scientific research. For me, as intriguing as the Taurus and ETs and free energy are, the most compelling question was, would understanding these things really help alleviate human suffering in any way? And it turns out it can. So much of the pain on the planet has to do with the lack of access to energy. Can you stay warm? Can you get food and water? Can you get hospital care? All that has to do with energy access. If there is a fundamental pattern, which makes sense to me that evolution would be efficient in that way, and we can align with that pattern to create new technologies that will solve these problems, then it's worth it to me to open my mind to these socially taboo subjects. If the new energy technologies were to be set free worldwide, uh, the change would be profound. It would uh, affect everybody. It would be uh, applicable everywhere. Th these technologies are absolutely the, the most important thing that's happened in the history of the world. So given the stakes, I decided to ask, who's benefiting from suppressing scientific research? Whose wealth and power are threatened by access to clean, free energy? Who has a motive to set up a world where so few have so much and so many have so little? As an independent researcher, I followed one of the cardinal rules of investigative journalism. If a story doesn't make sense, follow the money. <laughs>